Hi, and welcome to Teach, Move, Inspire Project. This is episode number four, and we're coming to you live from Ubud, Bali, with a good friend of mine, an incredible teacher, the Educational Director of Art of Motion Academy, Corinne Gertner. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. Yeah? Yeah, in the true sense of the word, I'm really, really good. Awesome. That is brilliant <laughs> to hear. Well, it is uh, fantastic to have you on the show. Mm. It's actually something that I... Um, when I first thought about doing this project, in interviewing inspiring teachers of the physical and the energetic body, you were one of the first people I thought about because you. you had <laughs> such a massive impact on me, particularly around the theoretical and practical applications of fascia. Mm. But before we go down that rabbit hole, <laughs> there'll be some people that don't know who you are mm -hmm. and what you do. So can you give us a little background about who you are and what the Art of Motion Academy is? Mm -hmm. So I'm a movement teacher. I'm a movement educator. Um, I love movement. I love anatomy. I love functional anatomy. And it has grown. So it has grown from when we started 15 years ago and we is my twin sister and I, her name is Monica, and it started as, <laughs> as a project to share what I'm passionate about, but Actually. I never had big business in mind or an huh. international school. It, um, uh, it was almost a bit random that I started teaching for a very small school in Sydney for a woman named Kimberly Garlick. She's wonderful. And she inspired me with contemporary Pilates or her version of Pilates. And, and it was so good. I lived in Perth at the time that I wanted to share. And I also wanted to go back to my home country, Switzerland. I thought mm -hmm. I could share and go back. And so my twin sister organized this very small course with five people only. and. I taught the course and it was so well received that uh, people were asking what's next and so my sister and I sat down on the kitchen table like maybe we should found the company Very and cool. so yeah exactly and then so um, <laughs> the name was like huh what matches the school that we work with where we rented a space from it's Tanz Art um, dance art it's like Art of Motion sounds good 20 minutes later we had founded Art of Motion <laughs> <laughs> no business plan no grand plan I was like okay and then uh, you know run with the project and it, it has grown really nicely and then the from the contemporary Pilates beginnings turned into a uh, curriculum which is still very close to my heart it took me about eight years um, to structure and then um, in um, <laughs> it was almost a fluid transition that I started with what is now called Slings Myofascial Training mm. and it started when I opened Tom Meyer's book and I understood very little mm -hmm. but what I understood is this is going to be important for the work I do and so then the the development of something new started right. to come about but i kind of needed the experience of structuring a curriculum that's yes contemporary but based on an established method the pilates mm. method change it you know, include movement science and so forth to create my own mm. And I don't mean to diminish the value of one, but it almost felt a little bit like this was practice. The contemporary Pilates mm. was practice to find my language, to find something that's really coming from within, inspired by other people, other methods, but in its way, it's what I feel came from within. Yeah, I totally get that. It's almost uh, the flavor I often think about with this topic is you almost need to see the picture inside the frame before you can step outside it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the contemporary Pilates gave you a great uh, picture to start working with. Mm -hmm. And I really, I'm, I'd be curious to hear very soon about um, 
that, that moment when you picked up anatomy trains in a way that diverted everything of what you were doing. Before we get there though, I'm, I'm also curious, um, one thing I've noticed about you and your team, because I've met a few of them by now, mm. and I've also met a number of people that are trained with you and I've sent a few people your way. And one thing I noticed, because you have the Perth office and the Switzerland office, mm -hmm. and then you teach all around the world. Mm -hmm. Like you teach a pretty intensive teaching schedule in Europe, and you have teachers that are teaching in Australia and elsewhere around the world. And one thing I notice is every person I've met that's involved in your company is equally as passionate, some might say obsessed, <laughs> as you are about, about you and about what you do and about the work that you're putting out in the world. So a curious question pops up for me in that, what do you think it is about you or the culture of the company that's inspiring people to be so passionate about this work? Thank you. <laughs> um, two months ago, my sister and I advertised for a new person at the office who is actually, together with my sister, looking at the international, uh, taking care of the international business. And my sister, because she leads the company, she wrote the, um, you know, all the text of, you know, that's what we offer, that's what we need. And I just contributed one sentence, which I truly think is it. I, I, what I wrote is that everyone at Art of Motion, as far as I see it, is a peaceful, positive movement activist. Mm. From the accountant to the, the administrator, to the teachers, to the educators. Mm. Even our cleaning team, for me, they are movement advocates. So it's like, I always, that, that was a big wish my sister and I had, I always wanted to maintain the sense of a family business and also the, the, the teachings are about structural integrity. Hmm. So the company needs to represent it. We need to live what we preach. We need to share generously. That's one of our big values. And so I think because that's what we are very clear about. That's what we put out. Mm. These are the people we attract. Mm. And so it's a thing I'm, I'm so grateful for and um, I'm a little proud of. <laughs> <laughs> As you should be. <laughs> yeah, that we have grown from this, you know, small family business into uh, an internationally operating school with not just, we're not just teaching around the world as a team, but for example, we have a team in Russia. Hmm. And you know, the, the, they're from Russia, they have grown up in a different culture, but whenever I'm there, I'm, uh, the, the, the sense is hard to describe. I hear them talk, I see them teach, I was like, you, you get it. You get it. You, you get the heart mm. of this message. It's culture independent, it's language mm. independent. If you get it, you get it. And so I feel we still have this unity. And maybe f if someone is coming in who, will the person will very quickly find out if the way we operate resonates with them or not. And then, you know, sometimes we also had, you know, natural yeah. fluctuations where someone left or, we had to let them go. I was like, you are wonderful, but... Just not, a, not quite the right fit. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Peaceful, positive movement advocate. Or activist. Activist. <laughs> I, I mean, I love that as just a sentence and I love that as a concept and it totally mm. makes sense that that creates the culture. Mm. Um, yeah, in particular, I think it just reminded me of Crystal who we were speaking about yesterday, who I met. I'm like, you need to go, <laughs> you need to go study with Corinne. There's something there. And I didn't know what it was. But it was obviously very much a, a kindred spirit. And it, it also strikes me as interesting considering the main vehicle of your education is the body, mm -hmm. but the, the culture that you're talking about, the thing that you can feel in it is much more than what's going on in the body. Mm -hmm. That's like a, a, a less easy to put your finger on, but equally as important to what you do. Completely. Yeah. yeah. And it's what you just described is what, makes the work so um, meaningful to me. Hmm. Oh, we can talk about the anatomy. I mean, that's really interesting. But it's what does it mean when you move it from here 
to hear. Mm. And that's, I, I don't want to divert too quickly to <laughs> anatomy, but one of the qualities that I defined for fascia is imponderability. Oh, that's, a, that's a great <laughs> word, imponderability, <laughs> yeah. like unable to ponder. Exactly. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. word. Is that your word or is that an actual word? It's an actual word, but the meaning, the way it's defined doesn't quite capture what I see as the meaning. Ah. It's, it's, the, it's, it's considered the opposite of being ponderable. You can calculate, you can measure, yeah. but imponderability is beyond the immeasurable. It's yes. what you can't even grasp. Beautiful. Mm. Imponderability. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And I also, I mean, I tend to think that the, the most exciting deep enriching experiences fall into that same category of imponderability like so you know it's so it, in a really small version of it it's almost like you know when you go on vacation you have this photo and you look at the, and it means so much to you because you remember everything that happened around that photo and then you go to show a friend that wasn't there and they're like oh that's a that's a nice statue <laughs> or whatever <laughs> but it's the everything else that the words can't quite be put on mm -hmm. and i love that you've kind of cross-wired the idea of imponderability um, in life to fascia mm -hmm. with the result that comes from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it also reminds me of uh, when I took your training, which I guess was four or three years? years? That's three crazy. And a half. Yeah. Three years ago. It was a big shift for me. And one of the things that perhaps falls into this category is I'd actually come almost directly from London. And I was training uh, a month-long teacher training in a, a form of yoga called Tripsikari, which is extraordinarily niche and extraordinarily yang. Um, it has some real beautiful aspects with focus and intention, but the whole practice was very rigid. So it's a two and a half hour practice every day. There's no flexion of the spine, not even in child's pose. You just kind of lean forward. You don't flex it for whatever reason. There's a 15 breath pinch of my rust and like my elbows were bloodied by the end of it. And I could feel myself through this training uh, getting, yeah, stronger, but also much more rigid. Not just in my practice, but in the way that I was moving. Like when we moved through the underground, un London Underground, like I was very rigid when I was speaking to my friend. I was very like narrow is what it felt like. And I was so grateful for that experience because when I came back and took the first two weeks of the training with you, I felt my whole body loosen up and then I felt my whole mindset loosen up and it just felt so dramatically different because of the juxtaposition mm -hmm. and interestingly enough when I tried to do the things that I was finding difficult strength wise before after the two weeks with you they became easier I was softer more flexible in body and mind and also stronger mm -hmm. so one thing I'd love to have you speak upon is um, that that effect and the way that the body moves to the mind and the mind moves to the body mm -hmm. through the vehicle of fascia for now. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I I uh, I remember before, but now I remember even more vividly why I loved having you in this training course because you just get it <laughs> and not just here but yeah. really in the ear so it's, it's awesome uh, because what you describe in in this experience is or has been one of my main motivators hmm. so say in terms of fascia but it's also personality and then they they blend together I'm a fashion Viking, so there are fashion Vikings na naturally, na naturally stable, a, a bit stiff, yeah, but um, strong. And and I'm in my fashion. I'm a Viking. Mm. Might look like a, the other end of the spectrum, which is a temple dancer. So people are very permeable in their fascia. Now that's not muscular strength or flexibility none of that it's a it's probably a genetic predisposition to be either more fascially stable or more permeable now i'm fascially stable and um i'm not just fascially stable i'm generally you know focused stable huh? i see structure <laughs> i like structure i like to flow as well but you know between cosmos and chaos i had to lean into chaos a little bit more because i'm more in the realms of structure totally 
yeah completely <laughs> and so um i remember this moment where i i came to perth which later became my home for a decade and um i needed to get a uh a visa to stay longer so I did a personal training course and everyone looked at me I was like you must be so flexible because I look like a, a ballerina you do actually I do and then they, they were so disappointed when I couldn't even touch the floor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were like what's wrong with you it's like mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the same time I also did a, a full-time education in yoga and uh, so I had these two worlds and um, both of them, you know, gave me insights. But what <laughs> in terms just of, of my own permeability here and here, the experience was actually quite similar. Mm. Yoga gave me a lot in many ways, but it was hard. Mm. And I muscled my way mm -hmm. through every yoga pose and I could hold it and I would sweat and someone would lean on me and, you know, it's just mm. like, that can't be it. Your warrior was very much a warrior. Everything was a warrior. Child's <laughs> <laughs> pose was a warrior. Down dog was a warrior dog. Was a warrior. Happy baby, very warrior, happy baby. I get it. Completely. And so... Um, I thought, no, no, this body has different, a, a different potential, but I need to find ways to access them. And so I started to, to experiment with different movements. And mm. I feel the contemporary Pilates got me a long way because I had strength and stability, but I didn't have what I now call dynamic core stability. Mm. So I needed that inner adaptable stability to let go in the outer body yeah and but then also was like okay this i got far but that's not it and that's when really fascia opened my mind and my body to different possibilities mm. and applying different techniques um and with this, then when I came back to yoga and I came to Radiate Life, I did amazing classes with you, I felt prepared. Yes. My body felt prepared for yoga. And then I progressed with yeah. yoga rather than <laughs> get through it. Yes. Yeah. Which is, I think, incredibly common in yoga. And I'm sure a lot of people listening will be able to relate if they have a yoga practice of that idea of there's a shape that I have to get to. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea of feeling, making it feel good and juicy and flowing is foreign because the focus is on creating the shape and it really just is muscling through, mm. which is why I think there's also a huge incidence of yoga related injuries. I think they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love your description of the, the flow. And in particular, I, it reminded me of something that you said on the training, uh, which was you were kind of the perfect genetic experiment because you, you're, you're not just a twin, you're an identical twin with That's Monica, right? right? And, and I'll let you tell it, but I'll rehash what I remember mm -hmm. of it. And it involved being uh, a very young girl at ballet, not being able to touch her toes, mm -hmm. through a journey through yoga, through contemporary Pilates, until what you've developed now. Mm -hmm. And I think you had the same body worker. And you went further down this path than Monica did at this point. I'm not sure if it's still the same. And he said something interesting about your body's changing because you're, what, 99.9% .9 genetically... Even, even more, like it's a very high percentage with mm -hmm. identical twins. So can you, mm -hmm. and I just think it's so interesting because you can't get a better case study than two people that are identical twins raised in the same way, living in the same culture, but then have a different mm -hmm. physical practice. Mm -hmm. Can you? Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll think you summed it up really nicely. So um, th that's exactly what it was. So what our, um, he's a rolfer, what he said is that my tissues and Monica, my sister's tissues, feel very different. Hmm. Um, or, ha you know, th th he started to change, noti uh, he noticed change um, in our bodies. And I, I do, I do believe that we, m we do have, you know, a predisposition to one way or another, but everything ex exists on a spectrum. And to go, this is me. And this is my spectrum, it's very narrow. My grandfather, my aunt, my mother, God knows who is like this. I will stay like this. 
most of us have a much wider spectrum and it's uh, Monica and I were a good example you know because we are so similar yet we live differently we move differently mm. and this creates a different composition in our body um, without any judgment she would <laughs> she would actually say the same um, and it's just for me that experience opens the door because it's a lift experience mm. and I have the comparison to from within say that to people and they say yes that's me I can't change I was like, you can yeah if my identical twin and I can change our body composition you too you can yeah but it's it's also James what you said before it's a mindset and I need to I need to tell about this experience mm. when I did a, a gyrokinesis <laughs> teacher training and it was 10 days and and I, I loved it and the, the the teacher she she is amazing too though the the one thing I, I the only thing I remember from her saying for 10 days was you can't she gave out you can't and one of the big things was like you can't rotate your spine you can't rotate your spine and I was like what <laughs> I'm a Pilates teacher, you know. Of yeah. course, uh, yeah, personality, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it probably took ten days. And on day ten, late in the afternoon, and and we did. Uh, uh, it's all spiraling, yes. Jarikinis is spiraling. I did this spiraling movement, and suddenly go like, why am I so stubborn? Mm. Uh, and then I I started to be able to actually rotate my spine, but <laughs> it was like. Oh, it's you, unwinding the body, recognizing your patterns and being willing because my stubbornness gets me a long way when I'm for hundreds of hours sitting on a, you know, a document. But it's like, when is that persistence and determination helpful? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. when is it holding me back and probably other people along with me? Totally. I mean, it's such a fine line between those two things, mm -hmm. between trying and pushing because there's something to achieve and being stuck in that because it's a previous pattern. And it reminds me a little, there's, um, there was a really kind of awful but entertaining science fiction book that I read. And it was about someone that could touch someone and jump into their body and their consciousness. It was interesting the way that every time she did this, she'd describe the body. She'd be like, oh, I wonder if he knows how tight his sh the spot between his shoulder blades are. And it's like the only experience that we really have is the experience of our own body. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you're saying you can't rotate your spine, you're like, of course I can. Well, actually, you didn't know until you gave up that story to actually feel like what it was to rotate the spine. Mm -hmm. And in particular, that, that narrow breadth thing is interesting. I, I think people, a lot of people will be in that boat of like, especially in yoga, I have tight hamstrings. Without even realizing that's very really the issue but still be in that story because if you're constantly telling yourself I have tight hamstrings I have tight well you know it's going to become true in some way mm -hmm. it's going to lead to something else so what I mean what do you say to people when they come to you with this idea of I can't change like I'm stuck in my way I have this what is your way of navigating them knowing that you've been in there in the, there in the past so um, and one thing, and, and this might be a projection, but I think it, there's truth in it for many people, is, is what you said, they need to believe it, not me. So there might be value of going like, no, I know you can change, but actually, I don't know. Because if they, it's something I hear in different versions of quite frequently, go like, I really want to change but I don't want to do things differently than I do, <laughs> right? I love my practice this way. I love to do all these hard abdominal yeah, exercises. Yeah, yeah. My back sore, yes. so can you help me with my back? Just please do not take away these abdominal exercises. It was like, so are you willing yeah. to give up something? Like I had to give up, say, to create that change in me. I had to give up a lot of ego. I can, hmm, hang on. I have a school for contemporary Pilates and as it's educational director, nah, my spine rotation is not that great and my mm. ribs are quite stuck. So it was a knowledge of where am I at? So let go of that. But also, <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned the, um, 
the, the tight hamstrings so many people struggle with and are the hamstrings tight? Deep lateral rotators, pelvic floor, is anything tight or what, like tight what's going on? And so, and something, any tension, any tightness is there for a reason. Hmm. Always. So are you willing to give that up to create a change? So, sorry, I'm going a little bit in no, a, in a, a, I love what you just a, said. a loop here, but what I would say to people is, you know, that there, there is potential for you to be who you feel you can be. You can change. It's a journey though. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, going forward, going backward, giving up, holding on, letting go a little bit more. Mm. It's a, it's a non-linear journey and it's a journey. It's one thing I'm really um, clear is there's no quick fix. Yeah. Um, so the question is, are you willing to enter this journey without a guarantee? <laughs> Maybe your hamstrings, if that's what it is, are still tight. Yeah. But along the way, you gained other benefits. Are you motivated to, to come onto that journey? Yeah, it's such a good point, and I, I really love what you said just then about um, if you're feeling something tight in your body, it's there for a reason. And I think that's huge once you really understand it. Because mm -hmm. uh, I get the feeling, and what I see in students before we guide them in other directions it's like the tightness in their body is treated as an enemy and may not be consciously stated as thus but it's like oh I feel tightness particularly in yoga I'm gonna pull harder so that thing gets longer so I feel this tightness which simply isn't the way that it works unless you're gonna break or tear something but um, it's it's a little like they're treating the body as a hindrance to the way that it should be or they want it to be rather than treating it as a friend with curiosity like meeting that tightness and being what is actually going on here and I'd love for you to give an example of this of um, how something could be tight from a physical practice or injury and how a muscle or something could be tight from something more emotional excellent so <clears throat> I will and I want to before I do um, give something very uh, tangible I feel I want to um, add on to something you said because mm. what you described is is an observation I and many of my educators we have made as well and some of them in their body not me because I'm naturally stable but I will refer now to one of my senior educators who you also met Mumu Mumu yeah she's she's, she's absolutely amazing. amazing she's amazing great human yeah great human and and just yeah wonderful educator and Sashley, her and I, we uh, are at opposite ends of yes. the scale. She is a temple dancer. And for a long time, she, she used to be a dancer also. And for a long time, she felt like a Viking yeah. because she held core tension, made her feel very tight. So she felt she needed to stretch to release that tightness. But what it led to was more core tension, more of that sense of something, something had to hold on it, could, totally completely but in her perception it, it's very hard to differentiate yes. where is it if, if it's long standing so the example i want to give and i think that would be probably no not probably it actually is very beneficial to many people regardless of the movement practice um, you do and it's on a use this hamstring example that you gave you know a lot of people think my hamstrings are really tight and so I'm now referring to the anatomy trains concept where Tom speaks about expresses so long movement oriented muscles which the hamstring muscles are and then deeper lying mm. locals and if we're looking for a deeper local, we have the very substantial adductor magnus muscle and the short head of the biceps femoris. Now, the adductor magnus is the myofascial pathway into the pelvic floor. Mm. Through the fascia of the small muscle, it's called the obturator internus. So it's part of a muscle group of deep muscles, deep lateral rotator muscles in the pelvis. 
and that leads into the pelvic floor. Mm. So when the adductor magnus is weak, tight, held, glued, so non-gliding, inelastic, just not functioning at its best, and it's a magnus, I mean it's bigger than the hamstring muscles, the individual hamstring muscles, so there is a lack of um, stability in the pelvis on the legs. Mm. And then what tends to happen is that weakness is compensated by the deep muscles, the deep lateral rotator muscles, which are intimately connected to the pelvic floor. And it's also compensated by the hamstrings. So then might express a little bit of hamstring tension, but then s say someone is you know, newly joining yoga and they see all these uh, people who do amazing forward falls, they're like, I wanna get there. And so they start to load their hamstrings mm -hmm. more stretched and forcefully like I did when I did my yoga education. And it adds load and tension to the hamstrings. So they just respond by like, no, nope, I yep. need to hold on even more. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a, you know, spiraling down cycle or they overload. And so then someone might get, and it's, it's quite frequent in yogis, in dancers, in long distance runners, very slight pain close to the sit bones, like a, 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 mm. a slight inflammation. Mm -hmm. It hurts through pressure, tension, and it's very hard to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And women have it more than men. Mm -hmm. And people who are actually capable, strong, flexible, have it more sometimes than people who are not, because they can load mm. these muscles. So <laughs> the strategy, and we have worked with this for a good number of years, works, is actually no stretching. Yes. Yeah. And attend to what support. So it's a principle of structural integration movement. If something is playing up, it's overloaded or suboptimally loaded. But anyway, the, the it signals because something it, it's not supported enough. Mm. So in s you can treat it directly if that's okay, but in structural integration, we support structures that are imbalanced. So then that means increase the movement functionality in the adductor magnus to unload the hamstrings. Mm. If you are very athletic, increase also the strength in the gluteus maximus together with the associated muscles like the latissimus dorsi and part of the quadriceps. They will unload the hamstrings further and then instead of relying on the hamstrings to be stabilizers and uh, movers with endurance and power, you have other myofascial structures that take on that work and everyone is happier mm -hmm. and the hamstrings then can let go more because they actually can without doing what you said before hold on because yeah, something needs to hold on so it's thinking more indirectly something hurts what can I do to support these structures so there is more movement freedom rather than just a short-term effect through stretch or actually sometimes it makes it worse or a massage. Yeah, beautiful answer. Um, there's a, a kind of a, a life rule that I've been playing around with over the past year or two, which is the thing is not the thing. And it, <laughs> and it applies to so many different situations. Mm -hmm. And I think with lasting chronic discomfort or pain in the body, where you feel it is almost never the cause of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's the result of an imbalance within the structures of your body as you're describing between the adductors and the hamstrings in this situation. Mm -hmm. And you also said something really fascinating as well, which I, I talk about a little in classes, which is try not to stretch. <laughs> like yeah. don't stretch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this funda soften. Soften. That's there's, it. Th there's a fundamental misunderstanding mm -hmm. around stretching, I think, and it's very I think it's unequivocally clear that your body's central nervous system response to stretching muscles which is a feeling of whatever you feel when you stretch your hamstring let's say is telling your body one very very clear thing and that is to stop mm -hmm. 
Because if you keep on going, it's going to break. And if it breaks, you're going to not be able to run away from the saber-toothed tigers, and you're not going to survive, and you're going to pro propagate, basically, right? right. So <laughs> then, there's, uh, there's, I, I'm curious to hear your view on this. It was actually something that Leslie Kamenoff said, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. And it sounds kind of similar, which is um, bad movement, he was referring to yoga here, is a lot of sensation in an isolated area. And good movement is distributed sensation over a greater area. Mm -hmm. And that felt like it had some, some depth to it. I'm curious to hear what you mm -hmm. think about it. Mm -hmm. um, let me answer this and then I'll, I'll go back because I didn't um, answer your question before completely. It was, was also about the emotional aspect. So oh wanna, yes, we'll come back I to that. I want to come back to For that, sure. yeah. Um, so I completely agree. And what I refer to in the, the slings concept is also noise mm. we are drawn to noise yes yeah yes, yes. so i've defined <laughs> kind of three areas one is quiet and quiet is where you are just contented in your body however quiet sometimes is really underappreciated as like that's not enough i need more mm. more of this or more stretching whatever it is and then there is there are the silenced areas parts of the body that you can no longer perceive you can't yes, feel them yes, anymore yes, yes. and some people do believe if i can't feel it it must be well mm -hmm. mm, that's a that's certainly an issue because sometimes it's in these areas that or these areas are the cause for the noise mm. that you feel mm -hmm, elsewhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so someone might have you know somatically disassociated from their pelvic floor hence the hamstrings really play up mm -hmm. and so the the but noise also applies to practice say what is scientifically validated for example is that very a very light stretch just when you start to feel okay now there is a stretch sensation it's absolutely valuable for fluidity hydration tissue rejuvenation but it's that beginning and many people go like that's not enough yes, and yeah they want more noise they want a lot more noise and the thing is if someone is already overstretched the noise is delayed mm. so receptors that tell us okay a tissue is now under stretch and no I don't want to go too far for all the reasons you mentioned before they don't they're not that um, sensitive anymore yes. so I need to stretch more and more and more to get to that noise yes. it's like being addicted to a drug in a way right completely and so it's that I can relate to what you said in the sense of okay if I'm looking for noise often it's very localized because you don't want your whole body to be in a noisy state but that thing that you really want to change whatever that is your hip flexors your hamstrings gonna that's where you want it to be and you're looking for that edge while a wide and it's also very muscular hmm. a, a wider distribution a little bit more quiet hmm. widespread has a, a very different quality very different benefits. Um, fascially, it's probably a bit more um, deep and extensive. And it's sometimes a lot more what someone needs. Mm. And then we're also very selective with noise. You know, I, I know a lot of people who like a lot of noise in their hamstrings when they stretch them, their glutes when they mm -hmm. work them. Mm -hmm. But, oh my God, if I feel my back, alarm bells go off. And I was like, hmm, quite selective, right? There it's good, there it's not good. It was mm. like, no, nah, I don't do this because I don't like that sensation. And that brings us back to emotion then. Say, um, I just love the roll downs you do in class and all the waves and because it gets people's spine moving mm. and we have broad fascial sheath that, that give us that widespread awareness of the back. But some people are quite afraid of it. In the beginning, I was like, Terrified. they just do totally resist. Do totally resist. And often they resist based on ideas, on memories, yeah. on this, on that. But 
do an abdominal workout with them and, and most people don't just go like, oh just built my abdominals bet you back off yeah. it'd be very dangerous for me so it's it's also where do we appreciate noise where do we don't and can we and i had to learn it myself can we just step back and be contented with it's a little more quiet it's a little wider but it benefits my body in a different way yeah yeah beautiful there's a, a teacher of mine that once said that movement complexity everything moves from the gross to the subtle mm -hmm. and i think in the beginning of us it's almost like we have to mm -hmm. go through the process of actually knowing what the noise is but then the hope is that you realize that that's not actually what you want mm -hmm. a quiet noise distributed through long periods or long areas around your body is as beautiful and effective and it reminds me a little bit another thing that was a little moment of insight in your training was I was having my right side was my more flexible side so I could get further into whatever splits or Janashishasana with my right leg than I could in my left leg so I'm like what's wrong with my left side that it's not like this and yet all of my problems are on my right side mm. so I had that moment of realization is when I really started to feeling in my body through your your very magic cueing like your way to get people into their bodies so well is that actually my left side was fully integrated from top to bottom I could feel it but it really wasn't noisy it was just there when I needed it and my right side I could feel from like here to here and then from my ribs to my hip and then from my hip to my knee mm -hmm. and my knee down because I'd put so much time over stretching certain parts of it like let's say just we'll use the hamstring analogy it's more complex obviously but just stretching my hamstring so yeah overall I had more flexibility but way less integration mm -hmm. And I think that's a really common thing that's happening as well. It's like st focusing on one specific aspect to gain greater length at the cost of the full integration of the lines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And I think just to dive into one little piece you, yeah. you said, which is also, um, which I have experienced through observation, it's when someone moves from not feeling to feeling hmm. the feeling might feel wrong hmm. and so i'll give you an example of one of my teachers who also is very permeable she's very mobile flexible and through the work she started for example to feel her hip flexors hmm. and she once came up to me and was like, oh, I don't think uh, something isn't working in my practice. I suddenly have this tension in my hip flexors. And we, you know, we looked at her body, looked at her movements, and I was like, wow, you're actually becoming stable now. <laughs> so because she couldn't feel it and she couldn't make, draw meaning from the sensation that she felt, mm. it fell into the category of not good. Yes. It's tension. It was like, no, this is called sensation. Yeah. And it's it's a big thing as well. Like w one thing you said that that distribution through the whole body, recognize it, but also, and that's a principle certainly of structural integration through motion, integrate new feelings. I don't believe it's good. Feel more. Feel more. Mm -hmm. Feel more. If you can't draw meaning from what you feel, you just create somatic chaos and confusion and then yeah someone might think oh this is tension i need to stretch it more it's like oh yeah <laughs> just progressed yes, just yes, embrace yes. the unknown um and see what comes from it yeah for sure and it kind of brings us full circle to that other piece the the emotional aspect mm -hmm. of fascia too because you know one thing that was really common i think in your work and a lot of yoga classes is that people will have emotional mm -hmm. like tears and, and moments of opening or fear or frightness and it doesn't have to be from a super noisy thing it can be a really gentle mm -hmm. thing as well and it it kind of has that flavor of accessing the parts of the body that they can't even hear and so I think that's a big part of it like there's a parts of your body that for everyone I think you just won't be able to access so they do something that accesses it and for whatever reason it was unaccessible that creates a flood of 
emotion is resultant to it. So I'm, I'm curious on a couple levels, um, and I'll ask the question a couple of different ways. It's like, you know, how does emotion get stored in the body? Mm-hmm. Which is a commonly held idea. Mm-hmm. How does that relate to fascia? And what is actually happening in the release? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to start on the outside and then go in and just um, so we are all because probably most of you are listening to this you maybe had had an experience of such so I kind of want to give it a a frame Hmm. and I'm thinking of an exercise I I will make this tangible thinking of an exercise that we call sternum massage so you lie on your belly you have a ball beneath your breastbone Hmm. and sometimes it's breath only or micro movement that's it so it's not dangerous it's a soft ball blow your sternum it's small yeah. yet it can evoke so many emotions mm. so it's not the ball it's not the movement it's the it what it triggers so it could be a blind spot could have been a blind spot an area someone hasn't in their sensory radar and by stimulating the skin the fascia you bring it back into their mm. insular cortex remember that bit <laughs> no it's, a, it's an area in the brain don't need to remember that bit there are other bits but it's one area where we process emotional information mm. or or feelings that turn into emotions so it evokes something, makes some people re- really happy or emotional or sad or angry you know, or, or afraid. And it's their body's response to the sensation that is emotionally interpreted in a certain way. Hmm. However, and, and that's why I'm saying this, there is also another element which I now heard more than uh, once two things one is experience past experiences and it was um an incredible thing a a woman said to me like she's so aware and she had breast cancer Mm. and so um although she was you know or is healthy now but when we did this movement or a similar movement like this she said to me afterwards she she could get into it could yield to it but <laughs> when she listened to me she would hear certain things like um, soften your jaw you know lengthen the neck but when I was talking about that area directly she said it was like ocean uh-huh. and then it was clear again because mm. I was talking about God knows what another one mm-hmm. so but she was so aware that she could stay in it like wow this is still you know not quite integrated Mm. so i I thought like wow if you have that awareness you know you you certainly change your body from within uh, as you progress but then there was another thing i heard it more than once and that people were very happy comfortable you know was like oh this is awesome i love this suddenly were like can't do it anymore Mm. And then through conversation, I learned that once it was the father, once it was a partner, they had an invasive heart surgery. And because they were still in recovery, they couldn't go there. And it wasn't there. Huh. Yeah, blind spot or this or that. No, it was the... It was the connection to a loved person until they were safe. Mm. They couldn't go there either. Mm. I was like, "Mm, not not everything is, of course it was theirs in a way, but uh, in relation to someone else. And and maybe sometimes also for those of you who teach, that's, it really opened my mind to go like, okay, pause. Don't always go like, oh, this is your thing, you know. Yes, it is, but this is not your time to do that movement it's not going to help Mm. there's a time and a place for opening 
emotions and for those people it wasn't the time hmm. it reminds me a little of even like postural patterns from father to son or daughter to mother they could have the father could have something in their life which collapses them inwards and it's like an inherited thing mm -hmm. um, that was never theirs to begin with but opening it can have a, a similar kind of reaction completely or even I think of my uh, an awesome experience I had um, actually while I was in Bali and I was writing under a lot of pressure slings in motion tree and I had this month and I was like, like this I was like I'm doing an experiment what if in all this uh, you know determination and a lot of this I don't do softening anymore I just go the other way around forcefully combat this I probably don't slouch I actually never do I've, I've you know. never seen you I don't think you've slouched in your life <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh, you know, but, and it just made me so anxious. Uh -huh. I was like, whoa! Yeah. And then my mental state just spiraled out of control. I was like, no, 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 no. I need to go into yeah. softness. So it's, you know, maybe generations, but it's also our own state that sometimes puts us into a certain body position. But for that moment, that's what it is. Acknowledge and just going the opposite direction is not getting you out of it it's more yes. acknowledge if you know maybe you recognize the cause mm. and then can you like as you said in class so beautiful can you soften into it and i believe you can come out of it but in a in a softer way yeah. rather than a forceful in a forceful manner yeah totally there's a there's a general maxim which is the yoga that you like the least is the one that you need the most and I think it almost reminds me of someone that's you know going, going, going in their job, and they're, and they're drinking more coffee to get to the place they're going, and they're stressed, and then they go to an Ashtanga class because it's doing and going and going and going, and just to this this insane level of building upon the stress and the anxiety and whatnot. When often what you need is the opposite, mm. and I think it's true the other way around. You know, I think there are people that are so full and soft that don't have the fire and the motivation, mm -hmm. or even the physical wise, like perhaps Mumu, the <laughs> outside structure was totally uh, soft and relaxed, but the inside structure was holding that I might do with a little bit more of structure, a little bit more of building up. Completely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think all of this brings us to fascia. And so where are emotions stored in the body? I don't know. Mm. I have a big, big uh, you know, conversation. So I want to go about it actually the other way around mm. and um, speak of something that I learned but also that I can it's it, the experience is so clear and and I just this morning I, I listened to a talk by the the uh, wonderful Robert Schleif hmm. um, about latest findings in you know fascia as a sensory organ and there are even more sensory receptors uh, in fascia so receptors that tell us how we feel basically and I think the latest number is about two and a half million oh uh, wow. 250, 250 million sorry 250 million at a very large number so you don't need to remember the number just remember that fascia is a sensory system like your eyes are a sensory organ taking visual information the ears auditory information the nose the mouth the skin um, tactile information and fascia largely coordinates movement hmm. uh, or uh, not coordinates movement but assists movement coordination so proprioception and interceptively tells us how we feel hmm. and since you did the training James I, I changed a little bit I said you know you for interception so that that in a sense of how do you feel you can ask how do you feel or even more refined how do you feel about the way you feel <laughs> <laughs> makes a big difference so uh, i'll give an example um that probably a lot of people can relate to say something difficult happened in life so, um, a loss and you you feel really deeply sad about the loss you experienced and then something else happens in that day and you maybe you need the lovely person you have a nice conversation and you feel refreshed and 
contented and invigorated. So how do you feel about that? Hmm. Some people are like, oh, what a relief. I just get a, a breeze from that sadness that I experience while someone else might feel guilty. And so the question, how do I feel sad, happy, contented, angry, whatever it is, is one thing, but how do I feel about it? To me, that is the introceptive question that through which the work with fascia really provides an avenue to gain clarity. Mm. Um, yeah. Can you put that? In? I love it. It's like it reminds me of the movie Inception. So <laughs> the next layer down. <laughs> what uh, can you put it in a in perhaps an example? Mm hmm. Yeah. So for example, let's go back to um, the example with the ball, and someone. Uh, is in class and they start to feel emotional mm. and what we see in class and you see in class as well is some people go what a relief and they just go with the feeling quietly but but they go with it they mm. surrender and so how do they feel about the way they feel? Acceptance at mm. that very moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, someone else might go like, not in class, <laughs> not in other people. Yeah, very much. Yeah, so how do they feel? Well, differently. And, and some people create drama. Yeah. Well, they're really noisy and they really need to show that they struggle and yeah. I'm, I feel I'm with it. Like, huh, different cover up too so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I remember, like I, I know a lot of times previous when I was getting to this work it's like I would start to feel something and then I would start analyzing it and the analyzing of it <laughs> took away from the sensation <laughs> and I no longer felt it like it was the opposite of I, I was avoiding the feeling of what was coming through my body by rationalizing mm -hmm. and looking for something logical in that in mm -hmm. that feeling state mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. the, I, I then love the, the when someone says, I think I feel. Yeah, I think I feel. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I've done that I many feel. times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so fascia is our, at the moment, based, you know, on, on these findings in, in terms of receptive density, they are our most influential sensory system. Mm. The eyes are very dominant, you know, what we see is usually, you know, we have a certain then uh, idea that changes everything else that we perceive. But fascia is the largest, it is body wide and it's internal. Mm. And it's very much related to, I call it homeokinesis, um, it's usually called homeostasis. So it's the, the physiological self-regulation of the body, it's our feelings basically keep us alive they make us feel alive big difference i can be alive and feel i'm barely surviving life mm. or i can feel radiantly alive <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> ah, <very> nice. <laughs> good name <laughs> um and it will also what i feel through my fascial system and and of course other interoceptive systems will also motivate my behaviors mm. and ideally of course the motivation is well-being oriented and so that comes to a large degree from the fascial system and I would like to um, clarify two things here feeling is sensation so back to to my example I can sense the ball on my sternum when I'm lying on it. That is a sensation. And for me, it's a little bit like Switzerland. It's neutral. There's nothing. <laughs> I'm Swiss. I love Switzerland. But, you know, so it's like, okay, I feel this. But then any sensation creates an emotional response. How do I feel about that pressure, about that, you know, touch, whatever, whatever I feel. And so in fascia t or through fascia let me say like this through fascia we sense mm -hmm. that's you know stretch strengthen mm -hmm. blind mm -hmm. that's what's happening in my body and then we have 
an emotional interpretation of what we feel mm. and it motivates us to do something yield to it change it mm. move out of it move deeper in it there's all every interceptive feeling is a motivator for behavior changes interesting is this roughly i mean is this analogous to proprioception interoception and then you're adding another layer or is it a different it's so proprioception that's a very good question so proprioception is <laughs> it's again it's for me it's neutral proprioception organizes internal relationships in the body so the way you stand is proprioceptive organization the way you move you coordinate your movements you time your movements that is all proprioception mm -hmm. it's like knowing where your body is in space if your eyes were closed exactly right gotcha. and so this can be trained clearly in in certain ways for example for example by um, consciously being aware how is my body organized maybe visual then go like uh -huh, that's what it feels like and repetition and then interception I probably should have said that before sorry interception classically was only associated with the viscera with internal organs that regulate um, homeo kinesis so that that physiological self for regulation so sensations like hunger thirst hmm. uh, the the need to inhale heartbeat the need to go to the toilet all of them they are interoceptive sensations now based on a lot from what I am um, learned is based from neuroscience or neuroanatomy that definition has been expanded now to uh, basically all of the feelings, emotional feelings, physical feelings that we experience and all emotional feelings guide our uh, behavior mm. towards um, well-being. So that term of interception includes everything you feel and then helps you to make internal choices to adapt your behavior and under so here we have proprioception coordinates your movement here we have interoception and for me interoception is what motivates your movement mm. proprioception moves you interoception motivates you to move in a certain way and both of them are part of our kinesthetic sense or kinesthesia is movement so our movement sense and so uh, for me a, uh, a lifelong journey of course for me and something I want to share with others is tying them together mm. it's because some people are extraordinarily proprioceptively coordinated yet their interoception the perception of mm. the meaning of their feelings is not quite where their proprioception is at and some people are interoceptively so refined yet they can't do a clear movement in space yeah so interesting <laughs> and like it reminds me a little bit of a lot of dancing troops that are you know smoking and drinking and incredibly unhealthy and then they move beautiful <laughs> like <'cause laughs> like just gorgeous movements uh -huh. like how these two things and it's like that's someone that's trained proprioceptive mm -hmm. ability really high but their actual feeling of how they're feeling is kind of low mm. or james sometimes in dance performance you see it too you probably see it too i see it i see a technically exceptional performance and it's empty yes got, totally what's going on i yeah, should I go why and i'm not mm -mm. and then you see the embodiment of, of wow, what they technically do so well god that is it or watch just a qigong master raise their arm and so you look at it and you're like there's something there mm -hmm. there's something on interoception i and this actually was a big piece that fell in for me from your blog article on this mm -hmm. you wrote one about it a couple of years mm -hmm. ago and i highly recommend reading it for teachers in particular and i and the it 
the way, just if people are listening and haven't quite grokked the idea that I think about it at least, is in your appropriate perception, obviously, your arm is parallel to the floor. Interception, if you go into a forward fold, if you take a yogi into a forward fold, the response will be something like, oh, I love this, it feels great. You take Joe on the bus, who works a nine to five, <laughs> sledgehammering car panels back into place or whatever, you put him in exactly the same shape, he's going, oh my God, why am I doing this? This is so painful. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the physiological nerve response is the same in both of these bodies, but the interpretation on the grossest level is very different. One equals with pain, one equals with pleasure. But then one thing that you're great at pulling out uh, is the refinement and subtlety of the sensation that you're feeling. Like I remember some of the questions you were asked would be like, well, is it specific or is it distributed? What color is it? Mm -hmm. What flavor is it? Or mm -hmm. whatever, and it gets more and more clear. Now that all falls under the category of interoception, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes, I don't know, to me fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it seems like what you said before is then you go a, a layer deeper and you go, how do I feel about the thing that I'm feeling? So it feels uh, soft, blue, <laughs> and whatever, happy. Mm -hmm. And then you go, well, how do I actually feel about that? Mm -hmm. And that seems like a really important step, particularly if you've got somebody that recognizes what that feeling is, um, frustration at their body for not going into a specific shape, mm -hmm. um, or pain and still going into a specific shape, or an emotional reaction. It's like, well, then how do I feel? Am I accepting this? Am I combating it? Am I fighting it? Am I allowing it? Is that more or less the way that this goes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also something uh, you, that's really important, something uh, like all you said is important, but the, um, uh, the boundary between interception and pain perception is a gray zone. Mm pain perception and interceptive sensation they take the same pathway through the spinal cord to the brain and are processed at least in part in similar areas so let's go to the lower back because it's uh, such a um, mm. or the, the back per se is such a sometimes interceptive shouldn't really say that but it's in analogies a little true it's a, a little bit of an interceptive desert hmm. in some people it's dried out it's no longer juicy mm. it's uh, no longer gliding mm -hmm. not because they have an issue in their back right now but they used to have one they used to experience pain in a certain movement say when they would do spine flexion for example is common or or something else so then there was movement avoidance and very well-meaning maybe advice from other people to not flex the spine anymore don't rotate the spine and never yes. do what we did in your classes so mm. awesomely you know these multi-dimensional movements like avoid all of them yes. you know brace brace and protect and Andre Fleming in one of the anatomy train uh, anatomy courses <laughs> I did with him um, he said something that just is still it's loud and clear in my head you can protect yourself to disability yeah totally completely and so that's sometimes what I see in people's back they protect it beyond the natural needs and then um, things go spiral down so then when they do a flexion movement, a rotational movement, they feel pain. Do they feel pain? Mm. Or are we now in that gray zone of you feel something and the anticipation of pain, the memory of pain, the person who said to you, you do not do that, otherwise your back's done. Mm. Is that what is creating fear? Mm. And then fear is creating pain to protect you from something that actually would make you healthier. Mm, totally. So then the, the art and the skill for us teachers and, and everyone who wants to get beyond these, uh, it's a limitation in the body that decreases your resilience. You actually become less resilient 
through these protective mechanisms. We need to find safe positions to go into those movement patterns that we fear, mm. that we, you did it so beautifully in your class, that we feel awkward with, we don't want to do, like for some people, I don't want to move my pelvis. Mm. Well, that has its reasons, but <laughs> your back <laughs> really needs you to move your pelvis. Yeah. Um, to bring fluid back into the tissue, to bring light back into these layers and tensile strength. So that when you do the awkward movement in the shower, your body will catch yes. you, your back will hold up. Um, and it's just, th it's back to the very beginning. It's a slow process because there are layers. It's not just your back and it's fascia. And I just heard a very recent study again. <laughs> I was like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> From Switzerland, actually. Um, that rotational movements are absolutely necessary for healthy discs. Yes. Uh, not so much for discs, but the fascia within and around them, we need to rotate the spine. We need to flex the spine. We do mm. need to do combined movements. And if we lost them very slowly, gradually, we reintegrate them and then, and you kind of, you are then in this, whoa, in this f interceptive fog, you're like, is it good or bad? Yes. Is it good or bad? And, uh, but you will never find out if you don't open the door to possibility and that's meaning staying in an uncertain and often very uncomfortable place. Yes. It's such an interesting thing to navigate. Um, you know, the, the whole time thing I think is so valuable, like it, it just does take time. And I remember Gil Headley on his original fuzz speech saying that fascia represents time. And he's talking about the, you know, the density of this tissue to, to stick and over time and time and time becomes denser and more thick. And it's like, I often think about, you know, occasionally you may wake up and your neck's cranked and you can work the neck and actually it, it's fine. It, it's gone because it was only six hours you were sleeping on it funny. But when you've been doing something your entire life, a postural pattern or an unbalancement of movements or just from your work or job, then you have very thick, very dense tissue mm -hmm. that no wonder when you feel it and move it and try to move it in a different way, your body goes, oh, this could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Even without injury, even without trauma, it can feel that way. So when it's juxtap well, put on top of injury and trauma, even more so. So it's like, it, it's these moments where like, I, I look at teaching and I look at you know, rooms of 20, 30, 50 people and it's almost, I almost get discouraged because <laughs> it's like, there's, how can I give any of this in an hour and a half? How can, how can I get across the idea that actually stretching is generally not a, and the way that most people understand it is, is, is not a good thing. And how can I get across the idea that actually everybody has some similar body patterns, but everybody's body pattern is you know, slightly different and get across the idea of um, just what we're speaking about, the more subtleties. And I looked at it and I just go, what? what? Why am I even doing this thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? 100%. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to go back to the beginning where I'm like, yes, yoga is it. <laughs> this is down dog, after down dog comes high plank and then it's, it's chaturanga. Like, obviously that's all you need to know, but no. Unconscious incompetent is yes. a bliss. It's beautiful. Sense. Beautiful. Isn't it yeah. though? It really is. <laughs> so um, and I guess one way to do it is kind of what you've done. So you've created your own school and your system and method uh, after going through a, a number of different directions mm. from dance and to yoga and to Pilates and mm. you run Pilates and the, the training that I took with you was the slings. Uh, mm. Is it still with a myofascial diploma? Mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. swing, which I highly, highly, highly recommend wherever <laughs> you are in the world. Um, and then you can get to break out some of the dogma or the paradigms and go very deeply into the thing that you find is important. Um, in which case, your path and seems to be very intertwined with fascia. Um, and I wonder if you would speak to, you know, in this pathway of creating your own system based around some of the theory and the knowledge around fascia, what you'd found so surprising relative to your past in Pilates and yoga? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so let me just go a step back and, and speak about the beginnings. Mm. So as I said to you, I, um, I started really by reading Thomas Meyer's book, Anatomy Trains. And at the time, I was in a very different place in my life. I lived in Perth. I was teaching yoga, I was teaching Pilates, I was teaching different classes. I was a full-time teacher and I, a few years before, just started with Art of Motion, but really humble beginnings. And I sat <laughs> in rural Western Australia on the land of a Dharma center with my ex-husband, lovely man, <laughs> really um, yeah, it was just the, the, the whole experience, it's, it's so vivid and you said that before, you know, you see that picture and you go like, wow, I remember, I see that scene, like mm. a photograph, I remember the, the smell, the, the, the texture, everything about it. And so Danny was assembling his tent and I opened Tom's book and I thought, it was really, it was like, wow, mm. th this is really going to change the way I move, the way ah. I teach. And I also thought, I'm going to meet this man and Danny is going really? like, what? <laughs> it seemed, and I usually don't have these things. You knew like straight away. I knew straight away and um, yeah, and I did meet the man and yeah. we have known each other now for 10 years and we met, I met him when I did my anatomy train structural integration education in England and he was still teaching at the time and we connected and I remember the conversation he came up to me once and said I created a bodywork system and it's a well it's a well shaped arc but we need movement to yeah. complete the arc and the spiral line is really what kind of triggered at the time anyway that that thought in him because the spiral line certainly needs tensile strength so we had this conversation and uh, James <laughs> then he said do you want to you know do you want to come to one of the teacher trainings that you had to train and I so wanted to say yes and I so had to say no that was the hardest thing ever because I was in I had a registered training organization in Australia I had a studio mm. I, I was just overcommitted and as much as I wanted to is not the right time but what I did do is incorporate Tom's concept I actually started before the education with him take it into contemporary Pilates mm. and I used it to explain anatomy especially for physiotherapists um, the anatomy of movement and so after I, I had done the training I called the Pilates and slings after I had done the structural integration training I threw away whatever I had done before and it's heartbreaking because you know how much development takes it's like no that needs to go it does not do the work justice so I started mm. fresh um, and look at it differently and also understand Tom's work differently so for everyone who has read the book that's great but there are layers mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in there so yeah uh, experience is key and so I started again, and <laughs> I can only describe it this way. I went to San Francisco. I was like, I'm going to start fresh and see what comes out of it. Two months, lock myself into an apartment that there because it was raining all the time, so very easy. <laughs> and it felt like someone just put out boxes of IKEA bits and pieces and go like, come on. No. Build. Build. <laughs> you know, and you have random pieces and proper pieces and maybe nothing is going to fit at the end. And I remember I was sitting there in desperation sometimes going like, what am I doing? What the, I'm, I'm sure this is some sort of puzzle, hmm. some sort of tense security, but I can't see it. So kind of pick up a piece, assemble, deconstruct, reconstruct and I had a, a new shape, but it still took eight years mm. of reshaping and and experiencing and also listen to people, my educators and, and and polish and polish and polish and then throw into the bin and refine. And so I guess my love for fascia, I love all of the body, but fascia for me is a tangible, perceptible, somatic 
medium for change. Mm. So my, my definition of movement at the moment is, what is movement? It's a neuro, myo, fascial, skeletal, psycho-emotional, perceptible synergy that is socially and linguistically influenced and in its wholeness imponderable. I think you need to say that again. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a few years. It, uh, it can take you a few years too. So, huh. so it's a neuro, yeah. myo, yeah. muscular, fascial, uh -huh. skeletal. Or let's go like this. The nervous system modulates movement. Yes. The muscular system produces movement through muscle contraction. The fascial system informs movement and converts muscular energy to the expression of movement and the expression itself are the bones moving. And then the, the psycho is the how do I think about movement and we all know that the way someone thinks about movement changes the way they move. Totally. The way you feel about movement changes the way to you move. So that's the emotional part. And then since you did the training, I added perceptual. Mm. And it's the, how do you feel about the way you feel? Mm. So mm -hmm. how do I think? But what does that mean for me? How mm. do you feel? What do does that mean for me? Etc. Etc. So perceptual synergy. So everything influences everything else. The nervous system influences muscles and fascia, my thinking and my feeling and that can be said for every element and then it's socially influenced so you're a traveler too you go to different cultures and you see different patterns <laughs> totally yeah completely so our immediate but also greater environment changes the way we move totally. and then i know you are just exquisite with language so the way we speak about movement to others but also to ourselves mm changes the way we move mm -hmm. words are powerful and then all of that really is quite imponderable so so yeah. that's the way we move and oh for me that's the interpretation so now fascia is the the tissue in the body of the body i'm sorry in which every other structure is embedded hmm. the nervous system the muscular system the skeletal system the visceral system the the way we think the other yeah, nervous system has fascia and of course what we just spoke about our feelings our sensations our emotions and our perception it's probably why i love fascia so much it's like this is the connective tissue mm. and interception i didn't say that before and interception too is not only self-awareness how do i feel in myself about myself but also <laughs> it facilitates that neuroanatomy it facilitates the recognition of other people's emotional states which brings us to empathy and to mm. social connections so I do feel it's the connective tissue in the body and between us, mm. I think. And it's just, it's the way it has changed my life or and other people's life. It's like, I'm, I'm going to stay with that probably for the rest of my <laughs> life. Yeah. And at the end, I know that much of what there yes, is to know. Exactly. <laughs> and I will just treasure every tiny little thing dot that I can connect because it just is life changing. Yeah, beautiful. Such beautifully said and I think it, uh, it really speaks to your own. I think that's another part of um, the culture that you create. You're just so passionate that it, 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 it bubbles <laughs> off you <laughs> and gets other people excited. But what I, what I find really interesting in particular about you is you have the passion and the zest for it, but you've also gone extremely deep into the theory of it. Like, uh, like I, 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 sometimes I describe you of having the...
did your your obsession and your passion is this something that's in your family is this from your parents or is like is your sister the same or is this 100 percent? oh really <laughs> okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think we're, i thought that many, i think you are quite an obsessive family probably my father at least uh. but the female side and then we go like that's it and we're diving in and it's like no coming out yes. for a long time and i love detail and then connecting detail to a bigger picture and I love anatomy I think and it's it's right what, what you say it's a it's a passion of me to inspire people's passion curiosity interest in anatomy beyond memorization yes that's empty which is most of what it has been for since there's been anatomy oh completely oh completely it needs to anatomy that's here I mean, yeah. that's good but it needs to go down and, and if you feel inspired by it yeah it, it's yeah, funny like you, you mentioned like connecting the different pieces of information something else that Leslie Kamenoff said that I thought was funny he's like um, you know a moment of epiphany uh, of like is, is connecting pieces of disparate information and, and coalesce them to a single idea and it's almost always followed immediately after by oh shit because <laughs> like oh I've been teaching I've been teaching that other thing for years and then he's like it's even worse when you start teaching training because then it's a bigger oh shit and then when you write a book <laughs> and I'm like I so know this about you because you're continuously working and rewriting and revising as you like it's very much an, an alive idea rather than a, a dead dead dogma right Mm. You've had plenty of oh shit moments. <laughs> oh, God, I think my life is defined by them. Uh, and it's, it's what you said before, you know, sometimes when you stand in front of class, like, whoa, what do I do? And then what you describe now is this. When I was teaching, like you, I feel a sense of responsibility. I know everyone is responsible for their journey, but still, I'm responsible for what I'm putting out. Totally. And so uh, sometimes in class, like, okay, you know, and dear everyone, Things are different now. <laughs> <laughs> but then in Sorry for what I said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. And then, you know, when you teach teachers like you do yeah. too, it's like, okay, yeah. because now, you know, this will sprinkle farther. And now I have in my own school I've taken on a little bit of a different role again. It's to teach the educators who teach the yes. educators to teach <laughs> teachers and it's like Ooh, and this, <laughs> and you can imagine yeah, where my mind is going sometimes like I'm dangerous yes like, totally and yeah. then when people come to me but you said and I recorded you yes like, I know they quote delete. you <laughs> <laughs> please give back I give uh, you money uh, <laughs> that is so funny and so I already can, can tell this so I've written this book now I want to finish it while I'm in Bali I've been working on it for, for eight years for that reason rewrite rewrite mm. learn new connective and oh, i thought like do not listen to thomas myers or robert schleip or carla steck or andre fleming or jap van der waal because you will learn more yes. and that means you read to rewrite and then everyone is going crazy who is editing and so forth i was like stop finish publish yes no, like, <laughs> okay <laughs> there can be future editions that's okay <laughs> there can be future editions exactly right um, it's, and it takes a lot for me it takes a, a lot of courage but then it's also to at one point it needs to it needs to go and mm. so the end of the book my last page um, I'm in this mag magnificent library where um, one of Vesalius one of the original Vesalius anatomist oh wow is yeah um, and I, I held it in my hands wow. and Tom held it in his hands where we're like, oh, <laughs> and so I'm in this library um, and the, the quote I put above is, do not quote what I once said, I'm wiser now. Oh, I like it. Mm -hmm. And it's my, my thing of saying, okay, you got it to the end of the book. Thank you very much. Yes. It's, you know, the knowledge has evolved. Yes. I love that. I got Do you not know, quote what I once I said because I'm wiser now. Well, it's so true, and and you know it's so funny. I think that's one of the re one of the big reasons why I find you such an inspiring teacher, because when I hear teachers say the opposite, like speak as if they know the answers, I'm immediately suspicious, because it can never be that black and white. The best you can do is say what well, you said. I'm constantly learning. 
I've developed some things that work for me and work for my student. And when I get to the end of my life, I know this much. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. And you know what? It really, once I, I got it, I really got it. Yeah. I was like, oh. No reason to rush anymore. Uh, there's nowhere to get. Yeah, there's nowhere to it's get. Like they, okay, there's always an, another book, another research piece, you know. And it, it was actually very liberating to know. Yes, there's no end point. No. Because it's always going to change and morph, <laughs> much like fascia. Exactly. <laughs> I um, I think we're we're coming up towards in the time. There's a mm. couple of little questions. One one juicy question and a couple of straightforward mm -hmm. questions. Juicy questions for those people that are, are watching and, and we'll let them know how to find you and the trainings that you've got so they can come and join them. But if there's some piece of advice you can give them for how they move through the world today. So the rest of the day where they're just going to sleep or going to wake up, like what would you say to them? It's a big question. So I'll just tell you the first few things yes. that kind of float into my mind. One, move in ways that make you feel good inside. Mm -hmm. It's like what you said in class, regardless of the shapes, regardless of other people's opinions about these movements, feeling contented and at home in your body or in the movements you do is a step to embodiment that's one but then the other and it seems a bit random mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing that came came to my mind was like and do some spiraling movements off the spine nice, <laughs> <laughs> nice. i like it broad and specific exactly perfect Perfect. Love that spiral line. Um, and, and last question is a fun one. It's if you could put a sign in every yoga space or movement space or Pilates studios in the world, what would that sign say? Huh. Yeah, what would that say? Movement freedom gives you inner freedom. Mm, movement freedom gives you inner mm. freedom. I dig that. That also feels very real to my experience mm. as well. To me, for me too. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and my guess is there going to be people listening to this that are, are really wanting to know where they can come study with you or your team. Mm. And I'll put all the details in the show notes. But also, what is the the first steps for someone that wants to find out more about your courses and trainings? Mm. So there are two things. One is the website, so it's artofmotion.com. So you'll find it in the notes. There's a lot of information. And what I also recommend doing, um, we put out a lot of videos mm. and they are free. You know, mm -hmm. some you can purchase, they're very inexpensive. Others are free. Engage and, and sense, does this work resonate with you? You know, things can sound good. You go like, oh yeah, this sounds really good, but does it feel good? You go like, oh yeah, 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 I want to know about this. So yeah, watch some of the YouTube videos and, and take it from there. And if you have the opportunity to do classes, we also have a list of people who teach our concepts, have a real life experience and go, yeah, that works for me. I, I really, I want to learn more. Beautiful. Mm. And I, I couldn't recommend Corinna highly enough. You probably get that idea. Um, I actually did one of your YouTube videos. I think it was a lateral line just a few months ago. It was awesome. Brought me right back to the training. Um, but I want to say um, I really uh, appreciate what you're putting out in the world. The idea of, of positive movement activists and the way that I see that your team really represent that and that the way that you're going down a kind of a brave new territory in the movement world giving people that sense of strength and softness and space to feel their bodies in a non-forceful way, mm -hmm. um, but very deep ways, I think is amazing. And you've had a massive, massive effect on the way that I view the body and the way that I move. I can see all of the pathways that came from that one training because of the work you do. So thank you. 
and thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you very much and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, James. Also, I need to say this to you know, I uh, and it's genuine, and I'm not saying it because of what you said, but having you in this training had a great influence on me too because oh. Oh, your questions. <laughs> I remember you at the end of the day, you left, and, and we met our like tomorrow he's showing up with at least two profound <laughs> questions and so it was and they were profound because they came from within we go oh, they go like let's see oh, and awesome. it, yeah absolutely awesome because then it triggers my brain i i need 